So I run a startup. So I was I was in Microsoft for more than 20 years, involved in building various products from Visual Studio towards the end, Microsoft Azure, certain services on Microsoft Azure. Two years back, I decided to build my own product versus build products within a corporate environment. So, the, so the, my company is Marketing AI. We are focused on a SaaS product. We use uh, deep learning, NLP models. So we are focused, we are a FinTech. So our target, target, target uh, customers are financial services industry. So in financial services, they have a lot of documents. Like any regulated industry, they have to make sure everything, everything is documented. Every transaction is written down and it can be audited. And the documents are to be retained for seven odd years. So we go, what do we do? We go in and look into those documents. We look for information within the documents, use basic deep learning techniques to create association between the documents and build intelligence out of it. And that helps financial services industry be more compliant, i.e. we automate a lot of the manual process so compliance becomes lot easier because their entire workflow is automated. That's what we do. But what are we going to do now? Uh, today's talk, we are going to talk about AI. We are going to talk about deep learning. But we're going to look at from a lens of how does that affect the classical traditional product management? So let me start with the story. Um, the face looks familiar. Can you recognize this person? I'm sorry? Is it the real colonel? It's the real colonel, yes. What's, he, what's his name? Sanders. Sanders, Sanders okay. Uh, anybody know? So, so this is all related to Colonel Sanders, the founder of KFC. What is this? What is this? A diner and a kitchen. kitchen. Well, it says Sanders Cafe. Uh, Sanders Cafe. And obviously there's a kitchen. But is the kitchen in use? Doesn't appear, sir. So. It looks more like a museum, right? Spick and span, everything in its place. Kitchen won't be this clean, right? So this is in Corbin, Kansas, where there is a where the first where Colonel Sanders established his first kitchen to make that KFC, you know, the chicken. He had an interesting story. Anybody knows Colonel Sanders' story? Well, uh, at the age of five, his father died. He quit school at the age of 16. At 17, by the age of 17, he had lost four jobs. And between, eight, by the, between his age, 18 to 22, he was in four jobs. And by 22, he was in no, no job. So what did he do within that four years? He was a railroad conductor and he quit within a year. He joined army and he quit within a year. He went to law school and he was barred from practicing law because he did something in the court that made that well, they decided that he's going to be barred, you know, from practicing law ever. And then he became an insurance agent. Wow, railroad conductor, law school, law, practicing law to an insurance agent, and but the common thing was he failed. He married in 18, he got married at the age of 18, and he became a father at the age of 19. At 20, his wife took his baby and ran away from him. And at 21, he tried to organize a kidnap, he tried to kidnap his own daughter, and he miserably failed. So even in that, he was a, so on, you know, uh, I, that story, going through the story is not relevant, but this is, this is the, uh, so, so everything that he touched, everything that he did, obviously was not a success. At the age of 65, he retired, having led a not so, a, a, maybe an average life at the age of 65. He got his first check, you know, the retirement check, and that check was, for $105 and that made him realize, oh, with $105, I'm not going to survive. 
which means the government is basically telling me I am not good for anything, even after retirement. So he decided to write his will and he sat down under a tree to write down his will. But then as he started writing, he started writing what all he could have done. And that changed his perspective. At every point in life, he said, oh, this is what I had a failure at this point. But at this point, could I have done something different? And of course, some of you may say this is like a decision tree. He did build a decision tree or what we will call a decision tree. So he built it, but instead of the path his life took, he took another path. And by the end of it, he felt energized. And he then looked back and said, what is that one thing I am good at that nobody else can do? He actually said, hmm, I think I cook chicken that my neighbors love. And that started the journey. At the age of 88, he died as a billionaire. Now, what is this, <clears throat> what is this uh, museum about? If you go into this museum, Corbin, they actually have a lot of cookers, pressure cookers. And that's what is relevant to our conversation today. Why did he have to, I mean, if you notice, it's mostly all the shelves have cookers. Why did he have to work with so many cookers? Or try out so many cookers? The part that the chicken temperature and cooking. What temperature and? What temperature and? What, what temperature and? What pressure. What pressure? And the heat. Heat. Temperature, heat, okay. Uh, it's it's recipe, no? it's consistency. It's consistency. 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 Time. Okay. But time. you all were solving a problem. What was the, what was he trying volume. to solve for? And what was he optimizing for? Volume. Volume of the pressure cooker. Volume. Meaning like size. Okay. That was one of the variables. Revenue. How much which I'm cooker? Sorry, I'm you to reach okay, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> The person you are trying to reach. <laughs> well, one person cooking instead of training a lot of other people to cook. Okay, this is let's go back. KFC. What type of a what type of a restaurant is that? Fast food. Is it? Speed. It's a fast food. So speed. You, if you go walk into KFC, are you planning to have dinner for the next one hour after this? What's the max time you you're going to spend at a KFC? Try <laughs> At max. Five minutes, you order something, how fast do you expect your chicken to arrive? Five minutes. Five minutes? Okay. Five. At that point in time, it was seven minutes for Sanders. Seven minutes. <clears throat> so seven is constant. Okay. So within seven minutes, he has to get his chicken out. Because people who walk in, he has to serve within that time. So time was the critical outcome that he... So within that time, so the, that those days, people, his competitors, so this is competition, his competition used to, either you had to choose to come and have a gourmet chicken, so you are ready to wait for 30 minutes, where they will fry it, make it, you know, <laughs> season it, and give you after 30 minutes, it will be perfect, or they will give you something very quick, but those quick and dirty were really dirty, because it was sticky. So he had to make something in between the gourmet chicken and the sticky chicken and not so sticky chicken that KFC today still has, but he had to get it in seven minutes. That is what he was optimizing for. And today we'll talk about, as we get into the product management, the key question is, what are we optimizing for? When we talk about an AI system, like I told you, the, uh, uh, the pro we are building a SaaS product, or we are built and we are uh, making some iterations of it. We have this, like there was this, I think uh, the group two said, hey, this is a conundrum. <clears throat> what are we optimizing for? When you, when, you manage, when you design and manage, there are many balancing act that, we, that you need to look at, and that's what we're going to look at. So, in a couple of minutes, we're going to look at traditional product management. I don't have time for that because that itself is a session. So we'll just rush through. Just as a, as a uh, look at the various aspects that come in a traditional product management. Because then we're going to see how some of the other stuff, how some of the things that are happening today, especially when you build, and virtually everybody today says, I'm building 
an AI ML solution. I am building a deep learning, um, a, a deep learning solution. Now, how is that going to affect the traditional product management? I think that's the goal that we're going for. That's the outcome that we're going to look at. It. So, so if you look at the traditional, if you look at the classical product management, there is a planning. So the group three was no, no, we are not going to go into product development. We are first the planning is very important. There is this process of customer discovery. What do customers want? Where are they? What are the trends? What I'm going to go to the government and understand how many parking permits are given. So there is this whole product planning phase that you're going to spend your time on. And then there's once you're clear that this is the product you're going to build. Nowadays, everybody uses Agile. You're going to sit with the team of engineers, your UX designers, and your data scientists. Uh, previously, data scientists was not there probably, but then you get into product development, you use Agile, Kanban, Scrum, one of that, to, to follow an Agile, to have a sprint of a, of a couple of weeks, to, typically, and you start developing product. Then you decide to launch your product. Once you launch your product, now you are, I have come up with the first version, now I need to manage the product. I need to come up with a roadmap. I have a roadmap. I need to now manage the roadmap. I need to come up with my next version. Is it a major version, minor version, so on. And then there is a leadership. So these are the five aspects of it. As I said, I'm not going to go into it for product planning of how it's important to know your customer, how you will size the market opportunity, analyze the competitive landscape, and create the product strategy. To Product development, where you prioritize, you come up with a lot of backlogs, you prioritize, differentiate your product, create a compelling customer experience, and then you accelerate your time to market. To product introduction, you, you put some things into your launch plan, and what do you do, what, how do you price it, how do you package it, to now your life cycle. And many a times in the life cycle, there is disruption. There was a time, <coughs> there was a time at Microsoft, we had a roadmap. Uh, roadmap for an operating system and then security came in security became a big issue in the marketplace remember the story early 2000 early 2000 security became important so the entire <coughs> Windows XT roadmap had to be altered an interim product had to be released nowadays when you when you when you see many products now in the industry uh, some of the names are here. There is, there are all these products were in market. Some of the spark products that you see from the vendors were in market. Everybody is taking a detour, a little bit of a detour. You know, because of what? Something has changed in the last two years. Privacy. Privacy. Because of? Cambridge yeah. Analytica. Yeah. So now what do they say? So we are just last year there was this big, big announcement of Alexa hardware. They showed Alexa across a range of devices, various consumer devices and so on. But then they took a pause. They took a deep breath. They spent 15 minutes in that launch one to talk about privacy. People who, uh, products, I mean rather companies that didn't put privacy friend, like probably Facebook or Google, now say, hey, we have a new privacy, we have a new privacy user terms. Uh, you know what, if you want, you can look at what information we have about you and if you, you have an option to delete it. So all those things are happening is because you have to tackle disruption. Either there's going to be property disruption, uh, disruption either there's going to be a technology disruption, or there's going to be a simple economic disruption. Or if you don't, or some what is happening now, there is a government regulation that seems to be looming. So you have to act towards that. Anyway, we want and then there's a product leadership, how you build your team, so on. That's a very, as if it was a fast run, uh, that's a traditional product management and the typical role, depending on your seniority, depending on where you are in the ladder, the PM ladder, you carry those responsibilities. Now let's come to the discussion now. Um, everybody knows about AI, ML, deep learning, right? I don't need to, do I need to cover those basics? AI, ML, deep learning. Can you go over the basics? Can you go over the basics? Okay. Who knows about them? It's a more capacity. Okay. <laughs> huh? 
to what capacity was the feedback? To what capacity? Not just the basic, what's the differences? Artificial intelligence, machine learning, I mean. Okay. <laughs> so, so, let's take an example. <clears throat> let's go back to the First Avenue, our famous First Avenue, and we'll keep coming back to it. First Avenue, you have so Brian has a camera here. He turns it turns it on turns it outside. Instead of looking at me, now it's looking at at the outside. It's taking pictures of all the all the vehicles that he goes because he wants to now build a garage. He's inspired all, he took all good notes and he now wants to build a probably a parking garage, right? Right, Brian? Um, right. <laughs> he lives he lives it every day, right? So he knows the problem. He feels it. Yeah. He's he wears the shoe. So so it takes a picture. Now you you sit down, you take all the pictures, you take a picture and you say, ah, this has got four wheels, this is a four wheeler, so I'm going to put it as a sedan. You're going to mark it, you're going to label it as a sedan or as an SUV or as a crossover or a hatchback. You're going to do some marking. What is marking? You're labeling it, you're unabating it. I mean, you can use whatever fancy term you want, but you're basically putting a label. You're creating a recognition. A truck comes, you label as a truck. Okay. Now that, the label one, is your data set. What is this example of? Supervised learning. It's an example of supervised learning under ML. So it's a supervised learning because human being is involved in labeling and so uh, and then so uh, they so they tell the machine i'm going to train the machine and the machine once it gets trained so i create a data set i and i label it that's a labeling that's a data set by which i train the machine and then the machine understands okay what i give you x predict y so there's an x and i predict y so that's machine learning where system learn things without being programmed. There is then called deep learning. I don't do any of this feature engineering. I don't do any labeling. I take Brian takes all these pictures, feeds it into the feeds into the neural network. It comes back and says it's a car, and you say no, no, it's not a car. It's a truck. You, you back propagate it. It learns looking at your data. Oh, that's a truck. And there is a lot of data that looks like truck and it understands that. So without just looking at your data, it now says, oh, there is a type of truck, there are types of cars. So it starts trying to act like human brains using a neural network. And that's where we say it's a deep learning model. AI, we are not there yet. The day Terminator, the, you know, we are able to replicate whatever, whatever happens in Terminator movie, the Hollywood movie, where intelligent machines think and act like humans, okay, that's, that's the day the Turing test is, uh, you know, Turing test will be won. That's the day probably people say it's at least 20, 25 years away. But then let's take that and talk about a couple of trends. <clears throat> so, so what I'm going to talk about is two trends here. So all these customer service like chatbots that are there, is that something that you would say is machine learning? Or is that AI? That's not AI? AI is a, is a bigger circle. Subset of AI is machine learning. Subset of machine learning is deep learning. So they are, they are subsets. It's all, they are all part of AI, but they are not at there where intelligent machines are going to think and act the way we have our subconscious, we have our emotions. That will be, that's the ultimate dream of AI. Now, chatbot, is it a machine learning or is it a deep learning? Depends. Depends on how they are architecting it. If they are using feature engineering that I just talked about, annotating, labeling it, and using supervised learning and classifying it using that, then it's a machine learning. Instead, they, are, they have lots of data for the chatbot. There are lots of data, and hence they say, okay, I'm going to <clears throat> I'm going to use the brute force method. I'm simplifying. I'm going to use the brute force method and make the machine interpret what, how to how to cluster, not classify. How to cluster it so that all likely stuff are clustered together? That is a deep learning. So chatbot could, you know, and I'll answer that. Your question will get answered as I go further. So, so let's talk about two trends. I'm going to talk about two trends, and then we're going to talk about the issues, issues from a PM perspective. So the first trend, scaling. What do you mean by scaling? 
There was a time we were using traditional machine learning, at least at the initial, maybe five years back. With the traditional machine learning, as you, as you started giving more and more data, at some point, as the red line shows, there is a plateau. The output or the performance of the system starts plateauing, which means you add any more data, your data, you increase your data set, the performance of your system is not going to change, the output is not going to change. And then came deep learning algorithms, the whole neural network from a convolutional CNN, RNN, uh, so on, where if you build a shallow network, just maybe one node or two node, you, you noticed there was a jump in the performance. More data yielded better performance. And with medium neural networks and then with deep neural networks, you saw there's a huge jump. Essentially, if you have more data, neural networks are hungry and they are able to give better performance. Outputs becomes better. So autonomous car driving. Why do you think all the, you know, there are quite a few companies behind autonomous driving. Why do they think, why do you think that you hear about accidents? You hear about some photographs. Oh, I saw, you know, there was this news article that an autonomous car driving, we spotted it. Here is a picture, which means they're doing test driving. What are they doing? Gathering, Gathering data. So that camera is, is detecting, oh, there is a pedestrian. What are the different types of pedestrian? How do I differentiate between a pedestrian and a, another car, another vehicle? So all that data is being gathered by doing a drive through. So you get more and more data. That data <coughs> is, is important because your performance and uh, it impacts your performance. So that's the first trend. So given that there is that more the data you have, the scaling, the neural networks or deep learning um, scales well. In the last couple of years, everybody is obviously trending towards the deep learning. But then you need to have data because you need to have data to, to really take advantage of neural networks. Otherwise, you have only so much, you only have so much data. If you have only so much data, all the, all the algorithms are going to perform nearly the same. That's not going to be any difference. So, let's look at staying on this first trend of scaling. How can we use any algorithm, okay, and we're going to talk a little about algorithms. How can I use to create a use case? a customer use case, that a problem that I want to solve. So one of the frameworks that we commonly use is called the CAP framework. The things that you can do with AI, with today's systems that are available, is CAP, classify, automate, predict. Those are the three things that you can do. That's what you see. Either, either the machines are classifying it, or they're automating, automating a manual task, or they're predicting something else based on some, some values that they see. I can predict the house values based on some trends. I can predict the, the stock ticker based on, based, on, based on the last 10 years data. So based on last 10 years data, based on prior years data, I can do some prediction. Or I can classify. I can look at all pictures of all the cars and try to classify them. So that's it. Now you can say, okay, who are we, who's the person I want to solve a problem for? And I've just taken a very common example. There is a customer. When I say customer, it's somebody outside your organization. He's not an employee. Then there is an employee who's in a business unit. And then there is always a backend. Why I took backend? Backend is where a lot of operations happen. A lot of manual processes happen that AI is today trying to disrupt that period. So those are the three classical, if you think you have different types, you can put it, but for example, I'm taking external, internal, back office. So let's say, okay, so I have a classification and I say classify customer. I want to classify customers who may want to upgrade. I have a lot of customers, but within that, I want to say who are the customers who, will, who are likely to upgrade, so I want to look at them. Who are power users and who may not, who may be just casual users. I can do a classification. Okay. How about if you come for a business unit, what kind of a problem, use case do you, do you see? Classify, business unit. Sales. Sales. What, what in sales? <coughs> uh, like 
price points to classification. Yeah, for your customers to get the highest price point. You want to segment. You want to segment your customers. Yeah. You want to segment. Okay. Any anybody else? Profiling. Yeah. Profiling your customers. Segmenting. Okay. There are there are types of customers. So classify them. Segment. The marketing calls it segmentation. You can do that. So or. You can take all the feedback that your customer that you receive from your customer, all the feedback that you receive from your customer, and classify your customer feedback. Bugs that you see, classify the different types of bugs that come. Operations, internal documents. Internal documents are filed. Internal documents are kept somewhere. There is a workflow that happens with documents. A document gets routed. Now that can be classified. Anomalies. Hey, there's something is missing in this document. So on. So, so on. You can go for automation. Automation sales. You can forecast sales. So you always ask your sales people to give forecast. Now you can automate it because there is a science behind it. You came up. The group one came up with some assumptions. Good set of assumptions. <laughs> automate that set of assumptions. You get forecasting. Customer onboarding. Uh, approval workflow, input data into CRM. These are some operations you can automate. Prediction from my prospective customers, who's likely to buy? How can I predict the product demand? I'm I'm in a I'm in the I'm in the product unit. I want to build certain products. I want to sh ship. So how do I build that many products so that I estimate the product demand? I want to control the inventory. <laughs> operations. Hey, can you do predictive maintenance? Can you make can you make sure that we don't run out of parking spot? That's the inventory shortfall. So I just put a cap framework. So this is how you come up with use cases. What are the use cases? What's the problem I'm going to solve? Is it external to me, internal to me, or is it operations based? And is it a classification, automation, or prediction? <clears throat> That's it. It's as simple as that. Look simple, but you quickly get a nine by you know a three by three matrix, or you add more more types of uh, users, your your matrix is going to expand, and then you can add figure out the challenges. Group three went into this. What are the challenges? What are the capabilities? What are the consequences? And what's the context? You add this. You are now building a product, a solution, which is essentially a product. Okay, let's take this one step further. Would you think this will also work for something which is just brand new, like not even an existing product? Will this framework for? Well, uh, I've been now involved at least in three products of, with, with this framework. Ground up. Completely ground up. <laughs> uh, within the corporate world and outside the corporate world, where we have gone into different domains. Right. And we have tried this out. So very simplistic, but you know, gets you get started. And then <clears throat> at the end of the day, you have to use these four to anchor into one. Right. And then prioritize yeah. and say, okay, this is what this is the one I'm going to do. So you can draw all this and say, okay, these are all the possibilities. Now, which one am I going to go for? That is the solution. So you have this opens up all the solutions that you can build. <clears throat> For a particular vertical industry or a horizontal industry, and then you can say, okay, within that, I can I use a revenue pivot. I can use a revenue pivot, or I can use there is a challenge. This customer is facing a huge challenges. I want to solve a pain point, or I let me put a context. Five in next five years, they're going to have some. This problem is going to continue, or it's going to get magnified because something else is going to happen. So this problem is going to magnify. So within the context, let me take. And attack this particular point because that's got the biggest potential. A side note before I go to the second second trend. Side note: This was a to your point. There were 200 startups. Series C founders were profiled. 200 uh, startup founders. Where did you get your product idea from? Which do you think? <clears throat> what did they say? Huh? 
the shoe that I wear bites me. I live every day. So, uh, in group two, he has seen from 90s the parking problem, how it has shifted, and he lives every day. So, you, you know, you live the pain every day, you, you obviously can relate to the solution that comes out. Or, you wear the shoes of the customer that you want to solve for and go through the pain that they're going for. What is that last one about? Last one is personal pain. Spin off. Personal yes. pain, spin off. I have an idea. I was working in a company and that company like iCertis. iCertis was working on a contract management. They got another idea because they worked with customers. They said, hey, we can build another product, but they spun it off as a separate company. Netflix, Netflix started as a streaming. They created what is now known as Roku, a device. Then they said, hey, we should not have Roku sitting under Netflix umbrella. We'll spin it off as a separate unit. So Roku became a separate company. Mm. And the team that was working under Netflix became an independent team. So those are some ideas. Those are some. Okay, so that's about, that's about scaling and where the ideas come from. Let's go to the second trend, end-to-end -end learning models. And this is connected with the, just now we talked about ML, deep learning. So let me try, this is my version of it, having worked with various deep learning models. I tend to think deep learning models because every day you can work with a, a different deep learning model. And like I, as, as I said, we work with documents, so we work in NLP, natural language processing. Within natural language processing, there are some breakthroughs that have happened in the last couple of years. So there is a BERT that Google came up with, which changed the way we, the information which was initially about words being converted to vectors and vectors being transformed as a transformer. Suddenly, you had 20 parameters that you can tune in a neural network, and that gave you a lot of power to understand English syntaxes. What is a sentence? What makes a paragraph? What makes a complete document? The amount of amount of precision you got, we, we were able to get out of that is phenomenal. But so, if you talk to somebody who's been working on a product for two years, they'll say, I have now 54 models. Sorry, 52 models, which means every two days they worked on one model. Every two weeks they worked on one model. That's the reality because you create a lot of models. So you can create a lot of models, but let me, let me just try to classify it for simplicity. Typically, you have a general dense neural network. That's what most people do. They have a four node. Four nodes of neural network. It's a multi-layer password. That's a typical starting, decent, getting started block. The second is you go into a sequence model, one dimension. RNN, LSTM, long short term memory, LSTM is a form of RNN or you can go for GRU which is another specialized within GRU gated record unit or you can go for attention model. These are like I told you GRU is a type of LSTM, LSTM is a type of RNN. They are all connected that's why I put them all together saying hey there is a, there is a sequence model which is in the one dimension and these are all examples of that that fall in that. Then there is image model. You want to build image models, which is convolution neural network, which is in which is in autonomous cars, which is in any any vision vision that you want. If you want to do some vision processing, you are going to use anything which to do with image. You are into convolutional neural network. It's either a 2D image or a 3D image, depending on the camera, depending on the input device. So that's that's a third type. Then the fourth, I just classified as advanced. What is advanced? There is unsupervised learning. Um, unsupervised learning like sparse coding, ISA, and SFH, or transfer learning, which is becoming very interesting in the last year or so. Where is transfer learning being used? In areas where data set is sparse. For example, in medical field, there are not many x-rays available to build data sets. One, there is a lot of privacy issues to get x-rays. And within that, so and how many x-rays do you take? How many x-rays you would have taken in your lifetime? Five, six. Five, six. One, right? That's, you know, uh, so it's one to five. So how many? So, so not many, not, so that, not many x-rays are there. 
within x-rays, if you if you are focused on pediatric, which is what they are they are looking at, there is a company that works on pediatric x-rays and then tries to look at that bone density and predict that based on the current bone density, the way bones are in a kid, when they become adult, these are some challenges they may have or these are the problems. Now where are you going to, as it is x-rays are going to be few and now you are saying pediatric x-rays. So what do you do? You get into transfer learning. <coughs> you, you look at a similar area, oh what are we looking at, oh it's a prediction problem. But what are, what are we trying to predict? By looking at what? We are looking at X-ray images. So it's an image. So let's go to some other industry where we look at images and we do prediction. We have built models for that because where there is because in that industry there is large amounts of data available, like photographing all the cars. And from now it's a little bad example because there is no baby car and there is no adult car. But something similar you look at it that there where you create models, where there is enough data set, large data sets available, then you transfer that expertise, that models to pediatric x-rays. And there are some interesting like ResNet and Inceptions models that have come in that really take, that really make you work with even fewer data set. Remember what I said, deep learning models require a lot of data, but transfer learning spins it on the head, it still works with large data set, but once you get it trained, you point it to an area where there is less data set. And then there is a reinforcement learning, there are co coefficient analysis models that, you know, that basically penalize you. So I walk, walk like this, I hit, then I know this is not the way, I should walk like this. So every time I, you get penalized, so that's how a child learns, by making mistakes, you penalize, you get hit, you learn, and that's how the model learns automatically. Can I add one more to that? Go ahead. Uh, imitation learning. Sure. Which has become pretty prevalent in the economy space of tracking what a person does or something else, something does, and then training your model to imitate the actions of the, of the actual driver or operator or whatever. Um, it seems to be a quick way to get up, and that's what actually what Tesla does. Mm -hmm. So, so, sorry. Uh, I was curious when you say imitated learning, how does it? So it looks like the actual driver doing it. You got the video from the car. You got the steering wheel angle. You have got the pedal, pedal forces. Between that, that all becomes your data set. Your data set is the video and the sonar data and so forth. Your ground truth is the telemetry, the steering angles, the pedal angles, the valve position, so forth and so on. Between those two, you can determine if this is what I see, this is what I can do. Imitation. You imitate. <clears throat> so, what is the, so what's the trend here? Great. So there is, a, there is an explosion of deep learning and it's going into areas, advanced areas like transfer learning and other you know, interesting interesting models are coming. You take you take NLP. There are there are things like Bert and Robot Robot Robert now coming up or ExcelNet. So there is there is a proliferation of models coming in that make the job much easier. That previously what was what was what was difficult is you know the threshold is being raised up. So the key trend is let's take two examples. Previously. You took an audio file, speech recognition. You wanted to do speech recognition. You got you got all the audio files. You computed it and passed it. Created created segments of your audio. <coughs> now you sit with a domain expert, which is a speech expert, and that speech expert helps you with phone me. What is phone me? Phonotics. Cat, kite. You know, there's a sounding. The, the phonotics and he says he, he helps you label your audio clips so that the recognizer recognizes it and translates that into text. So this is a step here. But nowadays speech recognition you directly take an audio clip put it into a uh, put it into a deep learning algorithm you get that out. It's straight. Same thing is happening now with what we just a few minutes talked about where previously autonomous driving cars 
had cameras to detect cars, detect pedestrians, by which you can now say, okay, there is a pedestrian walking there, there is a car going there, so I need to, I need to plot my tra trajectory without harming the pedestrian, without harming the other, without bumping into the other car. So you get the trajectory path, and that's your steering. Turn right, turn left. Now, all these cameras, there are multiple cameras now in autonomous driving. There are at least 10 cameras that I, that I saw with the last car that is there. All the 10 camera images, real time, comes into the, comes into the deep learning algorithm and directly input is given to the steering, steering wheel to take left or right or go straight. World War example from that too is a camera, the first one to get, or the, the, the top one and the number two, that's what Wayne does. That's how they're self every, every autonomous car driver is the only one doing number two. So, so. <laughs> most of them were doing this, but a year back, they're all, they're all driving, they've got enough data now with all the self-driving experience that even if they're not doing it, they'll all come here. That's where the autonomous car industry has shifted using deep learning models. So that's a trend. So when they were doing the... Do, doing feature, it, feature engineering. Yep. Right, the feature engineering. That time it was not reactive, not, not real time. Was it semi-autonomous or they were just testing it in that mode till they trained that model? So that is a... So that is... It was just a... It's a one step in between. Okay. Where there will be a part of data gathering and feature engineering. And then once you've trained your model, the car is ready to go. But now you're not doing all that, you're basically saying, as I keep getting data, I put it in the cloud and in the, the cloud, the, the DL learning model is getting trained and I give the input back into the car, the car is able to steer. But there's always that scope of a defect, right? Like, which happens every day with cars, right? Like they yeah, but then they have taken all the information here and put it into this. So they didn't start from zero. Right. So, so if this is version one, they already have version one. The car is running fine. Now I say, hey, I want the car to really do better. So it's they are, they are starting from a train from a train model. Now it's what can I do more than that? Uh, so, so that's what is happening. So this is a big, big. This is an end-to-end -end learning model that you see here, where, like, when we started, uh, at least in a startup world, you don't have a lot of data. So you you get into, you have to do feature engineering, you have to do labeling. But then you, you get the product out, you start, as your customers start using it, you get a lot more data. At some point you're going to say, I'm going to flick the switch and move into a deep learning algorithm because I've got enough data now where I can use a deep learning algorithm and that's going to give me better performance, better output. So let me switch, I'm ready for the switch. So. So, so let's talk about three issues. So we talked about two trends. Scaling, end-to-end -end learning models. How does it affect the world of PM? <laughs> and that's my last section of, of it and you're going to take some time going through this. Because it asks the first questions. What are we optimizing for? That's what your, your exercise started with, what are we optimizing for? The story of Colonel Sanders was what are we optimizing for? So let's talk about what are we optimizing for. There are other, other things here that is, I mean, you can take note. I'm, I'm not sure we'll have enough time to go for it. But let's take an example of what are we op optimizing for. Are we optimizing for precision? Are we optimizing for recall? Group, said, group two said there is this conundrum. And we are going to talk about a little bit of this. The conundrum only increases here. The, the, the struggle to strive for balance comes in. Let's take an example. I have a rain machine. Okay, I want to sell it to you. I have a rain machine. Uh, what's your name? Deepam. Deepam? Deepam. Deepam. Deepam has got another rain machine. Okay, we are two competitors. I have rain machine one. He has rain machine two. So let me tell you about my features of rain machine. You need rain machine in Seattle, right? It's been raining what? From December, it's been raining continuously. So you'll say, why do I need a raining machine? Every day it's going to rain. Anyway, <laughs> so let's assume, let's assume that this, uh, the first rain machine, both the rain machines, so I'm going to, uh, my rain machine predicted the next 100 days based on all the past data of Seattle. Okay, it predicted 
what's going to happen in the next 100 days, which is 3 months plus 10 more days probably. And how did it do? It predicted, it did some prediction and what was the actual? We'll see what did it predict and what was the actual. So the, <clears throat> so the first rain machine predicted for 100 days, it said it will rain for 10 days. And guess what? It rained for those 10 days. My machine predicted it will rain 10 days. And it rained for those 10 days. Good for you? Do you like my machine? So far. Why? So far. So far? <coughs> what is what are the data do you want? Huh? What happened to the other 90 days? Yeah. You are only giving me partial information. Ah, 90 days. Actually, 90 days, you know what? It didn't rain. 80 days it didn't rain. So it was great. Because it, it said 10 days, it rained 10 days, and other 80 days out of 90 didn't rain. Uh, there were 10 days actually it rained. It, 10 days <coughs> where it said that it won't rain, it predicted it won't rain, but it rained. So hey, you know what? My machine predicted 10 days accurately. 10 days it missed it when it when I said it won't when it won't rain, it actually rained. But there are 80 other days it said it won't rain and it didn't rain. Love my machine? It's there. It's good. Okay, Deepam comes and steps up and says, no, 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 look at it. I have 100 days. My machine said 50 days it will rain. It rained 10 days. It said 50 days it won't rain. And it didn't rain. Got it? It said 50 days it will rain. It rained 10 days. It said another 50 days it won't rain. It did. Whose machine is best? Whose machine would you like to buy? Yes. Why? I love the answer though. <laughs> no, sorry. Does, no, does this depend on the consequences of, of getting a false positive for rain and how much that bugs the hell out of you? This is more of a design question. You're saying this is a bug? <laughs> no, no, no. It's just no, a prediction bug. How much do you care about rain? It's the pain, it's the pain in the shoe. Uh -huh. And I'm, I'm just wondering if that's that's sort of a trick in the answer here. No, there's no trick in the answer. <laughs> you are on a, you are on the, you are on the, uh, you are on the path I want. I mean, that's the path. That's what I, I'm looking for: false positive, false negative. But, but before that, which machine is better? Depends on like what I want as a customer. Like, I okay. Want when do you want first? And when do you want second? I want to be wet. Hmm. I don't want to get rained on. You don't want to get rained on. And I hope the customer is also feeling the lack of Well, the second machine is just guessing, right? Because it's basically like it's no more sophisticated than flipping the coin and saying it's going to rain or not <laughs> rain. And then sometimes it's right. right? Okay. And uh -huh. this one probably is <laughs> well, it got 50, 50 plus 10, 60 days right. <laughs> it's flipping a coin. Yeah, it's 50 50. So that the so second one is flipping a coin. First one. First one seem to get the answer right more often. Mm -hmm. Both are not good because even the first one, mm. it's like 50% of the time I'm fine, 50% of the time I'm wet. So it both of them. <laughs> <laughs> so that is also a flip of the coin actually. Right. You can look, look beneath the colors, it's actually a flip of the coin. You will get wet half the time. Yeah. So right. At least in the second one I know for these is I am, it is for sure that sound's going to go rain. You know? Yeah. And I can go with the mentality then. I mean, at least I would know what I'm signing up for. Like so, I will know. So in the, when it predicts it's not going to rain, right? You can be hundred percent sure right. it's not going to rain. Yeah, at least I could be prepared for that. So if it predicts it's not going to rain, you don't need to take an umbrella with you or a raincoat. Right. But when it predicts that there's going to be rain, hmm. You don't know. You don't know. That's okay. But is it good? Because I have an umbrella. Because it said. It said, or I have a rain, a rain sheet. Uh, it said it's going to rain. Ten days it worked. Other forty days, I just carried an umbrella. But hey, I didn't get wet. You never saw that up. 
Huh? <laughs> top one is yeah. only 90 days, the bottom one's 100. Yeah, they're both 100. They're both 100. They're both 100. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they don't. Because the negative, you predict it won't rain and rain, that's the same as the 10, the if positive that rained above, so it's actually 90 days, not 100. It's 90 and 10. I know, but huh. the prediction is 90, but it actually rained. Hang on. You see, you positive is 10, right? So rain 10 days. Those are the same 10 days that you predicted it wouldn't rain and it didn't. No, 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 no. Oh, hang on. No. Are there your numbers still on that? <laughs> no, that's a different. It, doesn't match it predicted, it predicted 90 days it wouldn't rain. Then the numbers, then the upper number needs to be 80, not 10. Because 80, it rained, it did, it did not, or it rained. In the second line, you say it rained 80 days. But on the top line, you say it rained 10. And the data sets the same. No, it's negative. It did rain. I, it no. predicted it's not, it won't rain, it didn't rain, it is. No, the total, the matrix total is 100, not no, it's yeah. not, it's not 100. Yeah. But anyway, I, well, I think you have the point. Uh, okay, so, so this, so, in this machine, I won't get wet. Right. In this machine. You'll never know. you never know? <laughs> in this machine, if it says, it's 50-50. So which one do you want? I don't want to get wet. None. Hmm? <laughs> yes, sir. Well, I mean, this is uh, very, very common in, in, the, in the medical industry with sensitivity and um, sensitivity, and often these two have to go hand in hand, and it has to do with product management. Um, uh -huh. We want a cheap machine that will rule out the false um, uh, positive, and then you add on the expensive machine that will get. So I don't know if this is necessarily by the wrong answer, it depends on how you're defining your product in your audience. Excellent point. So let's go into precision recall. Oh. Oh, yes, Pat. Uh, I don't know if like you're going to get into this, but um, I, at least for me, when um, when I'm dealing with her, um, her, uh, classification problems, I use an uh, area under the curve as a way to, I guess, like figure out how well the model. You underfit? Huh? You underfit your curve? No, area under the curve. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's, the, that's the measurement. Uh, yeah. This is precision and recall. We are either going to be underfitting the curve or overfitting the curve. Sorry, what? Either we are going to be <coughs> precision recall is about curve. Yeah. It's about how do I fit it? Am I going to underfit it or am I going to overfit it? Yeah. So we are coming to the curve. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yep. Positive, false, positive. Yep. We are false, positive. So we are fitting a curve. Either we'll underfit it or we'll overfit it. The question is which one? This is important. So let's look at precision. So precision is true positive. What is true positive? Prediction was positive. Actually, it right, occurred. So it's true positive. On the other side, prediction was negative. It, it turned out that it didn't rain. So it's true negative. So these are true positive, true negative. The other two is where it becomes two different outcomes. One, rain is predicted but it doesn't occur. Second, rain is not predicted, but it occurs. So this is false positive. That event is going to happen, but it doesn't happen. Here, it's false negative. Okay. So what is precision? Mathematical equation. Take the, take the true positive, divide by true positive plus false positive. Take the true positive, divide by false positive, Recall, take the true positive, divide by the addition. So we're going this way or this way. Now let's put an example here. So for this machine, the what will be the precision? First machine. This divided by this, this divided by total of this. So what will be the precision? I took whole number so that it's easy. I know it's long day. What's precision? What, what's the recall for the first machine? 100 percent. 10. 10 divided by total of this, total of rows. So 10 divided by 10, precision is 100 percent. But 10 recall is 10 divided by 20, so it's only 50 percent. What will be the, for the second machine, for T-Pumps machine? 
precision is 20%, yeah. but recall is 100%. So why does it matter? So you can see one machine is very precise. Other machine is recall. It's more generic. And he made, alluded to the point, in medical industry, depends on the situation, you either require this or you require that. Let's take the same example. Okay, rain is fine. Let's take cancer detection. Let's go to the medical industry. So this becomes machine one, machine two. If it is cancer detection, which machine would you now go for? First one, why? You want to be precise? So, so let's break it. Cancer detection, you are a patient. You are, you are not a doctor. You are one of the patient. So would you prefer this machine or would you prefer this machine as a potential patient, as a probable patient? Below one. Below one. Why? Because whenever I say that they are not sick, uh, they are really not sick. I'm not missing the cases where... You are not missing the cases. Yes. It's good to... When it is cancer detection, it's good if, if you tell me I'm positive and later I will take more tests and I'm ruled out, I can live with that. However, if you miss me and later I'm found out that I'm detecting cancer, that's what the first machine will do. It could miss me. If it misses me, I may not do further tests that will rule me out. Second machine, I will do further tests that will either rule me out or tell me that it is confirmed. So it just scares you for a little while in those cases? Scares you for a little while but gives you short term pain, long term gain. Save you from lawsuit. <laughs> now let's flip it. Now you are the doctor. Same machine, now you are the doctor. Which machine would you prefer? Still the second act, why would I want to? As a doctor, you give, can you give a wrong diagnosis? But I don't want to miss out on the patient also. He may come back again. <laughs> <laughs> but if you tell a patient he's, he's got cancer and it proves, will it, what about your reputation as a doctor? As a doctor. But if I tell him that you don't have cancer and he goes ahead and he has cancer, after a year, you may find out. So you can say, okay. <laughs> you have, uh, yeah, I know, I know. It's not morally correct, but hey, as a doctor, which one do you prefer? Flips it, <clears throat> you will prefer. As a doctor, you will prefer <laughs> machine one. See, quickly it changes. Just change the role of a patient to doctor changes. Netflix recommendation. Which one does Netflix use? Hmm? Two. Why? It throws so many things that it's so useless. Yeah. First one. Because Netflix uses an algorithm that you look at probably, you have attention span very low. You have 10 recommendations, within that you have to take the movie. So it has, has to give you good recommendations. Airport screening. First one, second one. Don't want to miss out anything. You don't want to miss out anybody. There is something called secondary scheming. Right. It's okay, I have doubt about you, but I'll take you for secondary scheming and then I'll clear you. Uh, that's okay. But long lines are fine. This means long lines. That's fine because I'm going to catch a long, large pool. So, what it means between the uh, precision and this one is one is, like he said in the medical industry, I want to go for a small pool and I want to be highly accurate. Like Google results, first page is precise. That what comes in the first page is what most of the people do. It has to be highly accurate. I go for a precision algorithm. In cases where I need to get all possible ch chances, I don't want to miss anybody. I go for recall. Why do I talk about it? When you're designing AI systems, you have to either choose. As you see, these two are pulling in different directions. If you go for accuracy, pinpoint accuracy, you are going for precision. If you want to go for more generic, catch everything, you're going for recall. It's one or the other. Your algorithm has to be tuned for precision or for recall. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by this. What, what actually happens in a medical system when you don't see the doctor, they gave you tech number two, and then it 
the composite that they say, we need to do this blood test, and they give you test number one. Mm -hmm. You know, like an MRI, blood test versus an MRI. Uh, so when you when you create an algorithm, could you do the same, create an algorithm that is at number one, and then take the data set there and run it to a second algorithm? That's what Google does, that's what Netflix does. Mm -hmm. They use two algorithms. That's what Google does. Okay. Your first page is precision algorithm. Pages 2 to pages 10, where it has got everything else, are recall algorithm. It just combines it and displays it. But there are two different algorithms. Tuned. It's like a car engine. It's tuned either for speed or for NPG. <clears throat> you bring it. Netflix, if you see now, more and more, they give you recommendation for you. But they also start giving you based on your demographic. People like you, there's another thing, people like you, have also looked at this. What are they trying to do? They are trying to guess your demographic and also then pick up a more broader range. Most of the time that one is not more generic. So you can see Netflix is now playing with those two algorithms. Okay. Uh, one more thing. And we'll talk, talk more a little about that. I think we have a question here, right? Oh, I, just, I just wanted to kind of like the two brain machines, right, are the results of two different data algorithms. One that's tuned for precision, one that's tuned for recall. And so you're saying that it's in reality, it's not possible to have a model that does both. It's like mathematics. You have to optimize. That's a, as a PM, you have to optimize. You have to optimize based on your data set, based on your data, you have to be clear what you, what is what you are optimizing. So that's really like that context and consequences, right? Like what's the cost of guessing wrong versus what's the, like what's the opportunity exactly. for what guessing right? Mm -hmm. okay. Now there is an F1, I mean, you can, you can later Google for F1 score. So now people said, hmm, can you, can't you create a balance? So they said, okay, precision into recall divided by precision plus recall. There's an F1 score. You say, mm, you know what, I don't want it to be super tuned here. I don't want it to be super tuned to the extreme. Soften it, soften it. There's an F score for that. But again, the point is, it's two points of the scale. You're softening it. You're losing precision, losing recall, and coming to the middle. So then so, you kind of try to fine tune it. You can then balance. optimize. So like the more certainty you have in one area, or one type of model is going to be more valuable and like then also probably the cost of getting to those optimized models is That's another thing to be Because every time you hit an AI product, that's what we are like. When we go and we look at documents, we say in some documents, the amount that is there in the documents is critical. At certain type of documents. In certain other documents, the information is not that critical because it doesn't have amount. But it needs some information like addresses all pulled out. You can go wrong here and there with an address. You see that? So that's what. So so every. So what are we optimizing for? It becomes a real world situation. So in the case of Netflix, maybe I don't click on the first recommendation, but probably eventually, if I'm, they give me ten reasonable ones, probably I'll pick a third or a fifth. And the risk of me canceling my subscription because of a bad recommendation is not that bad. It's not the bad. The consequence you have to wait it out. Okay. Let's talk about testing. Now comes okay. Now that we now we see optimization. Okay, now I'm optimizing. Now it has to be tested, right? How does how is testing different? Why testing is important and what where the challenges come? There is something called an AI flywheel effect. Everybody knows about the AI flywheel effect. Yes, no, no, no. Okay, let's take an example. Um, there was a CB Insights. It's a very famous research uh, organization. They put all the research online. So what? This is a published one, as an example. So they said, hey, we came up with a product. We assumed, based on some hypothesis, we came up with a version one of the product. We didn't have a lot of data, so we came up with a product with very less with very less data about our customer. But as soon as we take, took the product out, customer signed on. Because customer signed on. We now got real data from customers. Now we got more data. More data, we already had some data, now it's got supplemented with more data. That data makes my deep learning algorithms better. Performance becomes better and I give a better product. Better product, more customers. More customers, more data. More data, better, better performance of algorithms. 
better performance of algorithms, better product, more consumer. You see, this virtue cycle is what every AI company tries to go for. You know, so you need more data, you need more, but to get more data, you need more users, you get more data, your product gets better and better. <coughs> now, how will you test? <laughs> because now that your algorithms are changing, uh, uh, your algorithms are getting more data, it's adapting. How do you test? Now let's look at an example and I'll close with this. Now, typically you take a data set and you, you slice it into 70, 30. <coughs> Why it has been done? It's been now proven over and over that that works. How? You take 70% 70, 70 of your data for training, training your model. And then you keep the rest 30 for your dev and test. You use to dev test because why you keep the 30? You know this 30, this is the output you have to get. So you use that to test it. It's based on <coughs> the training data, it gives you an output. You test it with your test, test data. Matches are, ah, I have accuracy. This is what accuracy either for precision or for recall. So 70-30 is now what is an industry standard that we go for. So we'll now take that, break that into an example. Let me take a fast, first example, error rate. So we are going for error rate. In the, we are looking at three cases. First error rate, the human level error that is found, is that we found for that particular problem is 1%. Your training set is 5%. Your dev set error is 6%. That's the first scenario. Second scenario, human error is 1%. Training set is very close, it's 2%, but your dev set has got a huge variance. That's 6%. The last one, there is a big difference between human error, training set, dev set. There is a, there is a huge difference. Whenever there is a difference between human error and your training set, it means there is bias in your training data. Whenever there is a huge difference between training and dev set, that's called variance. And whenever both, it's bias, your data is biased as well as there is variance. Okay, now let's break, now let's break this into what happens if I get high bias? It means you need to build a bigger model. You need to train your model longer. Or worse come, you have to come up with a new model architecture. That's, uh, that's typically a, a long, it's, it's not that trivial. This is what you do. If it's high variance, it means you need more data. You don't have enough data set, you need to add more data. You need to regularize your data. Your data is not normalized. Regularize it. And worst case, even for high variance, hmm, sometimes you have to change your architecture. Again, not a recommended, but sometimes that's a U-turn you have to take. So this is a question for you. <clears throat> now, we had this thing like, typical human error in financial industry is 3%. A financial advisor who's much senior than the back office their, their error rate is 1%. You go to a more senior, seasoned financial advisor, their error rate is 0.7%. You get a, in the room, you're able to get the seasoned expert advisors to sit together and do a set of document processing manually. Then the error rate is only 0.5%. Which one of these percentages? Now you're, you're now, you're going to test we just talked about bias, variance against human level performance. Now you're going to do a testing. Which number will you benchmark your model? To? Depends on the problem you're solving for and your user. It doesn't depend. <laughs> I've given you all the data here. No, you have to take one. Are you going to take a human level performance? Are you going to take an expert? Depends on my industry, right? Like can I, how much, like for a financial model, you want to go as less as you want to, you know? <laughs> yes, Ben. I would try to benchmark it against the team of experts, because like you're putting all that engineering and work to collect the data and train the model, you might as well have like pretty expert level. Yeah. Um, exactly. 
If you are building up, if you are testing it, you test, you have to come, you have to say your product has to be 0.4%. Because you have to say, my product can beat a bunch of ex-human experts. That's what, that is what you have to test to. Okay? That's first. That's, that's one of the questions where there is no it depends answer. It's got a very, <laughs> you have to, your AI system has to do it. So, how is this breaking in? This breaking up happens with PM, which means PM now have to come up with data sets. They have to, from the same distribution, not mixing it up, they have to also come up with what the metric evaluation I just talked about. What are we benchmarking to? Are we going for precision or recall? And what is going to be our bias and variance levels? You as a PM have to come up with data set, you have to come up with a metric. What does an AI scientist or engineer do? He acquires the training data and then develops a system to perform to this. That's the line of delineation that's happening now. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this example and we'll close with that. Talking about testing, there are a couple of things you have to be that you have to be cognizant of. Story one. Already pays the uh, pan is smiling. Yeah, sir, uh, next to that team. <laughs> so anybody remember this since we talked about chatbot? Hey, what's a chatbot? Anybody remembers the story? Yeah. Yeah. Race is very good, right? yeah. <laughs> so the, the it was an official chatbot of Microsoft AI, which could be the whole idea was a chatbot will get trained on your conversations to come and chat with me. And based on the conversation, it'll get better and better. Flywheel effect. But what do people do, <laughs> right? People, <clears throat> people trained it like this, like this, like this. There was one, one other thing that I, I was not very sure, you know, it said we'll build a wall. That also how it was got trained. I mean, I don't have any opinions on that, but you know, a real story. How training data, if you, you know, training data and testing, that's one story. The second story is a lot even more interesting. <coughs> Who all have used Google Translate? <clears throat> Yeah, everybody knows. Okay, so tell me about this. Google Translate. This is some language, and this is obviously the language we know. The story is, on your left is Turkish. Anybody speaks Turkish? Or it's, okay. So, can I ask you, uh, in Turkish, what is it for he? He? Mm -hmm. We don't have she or he, we say all. Oh, the first word. So Turkish is a gender neutral language. But you can see in the translation. Huh. <laughs> He's a cookie, he's an engineer. Aha. Uh -huh. He's happy. Wow. So it's the translation, it has done a he, she. Now how did it do? Okay, let me let me give a quick background to that. You know, I worked, I I know I know fair amount of search algorithms. Now that I'm outside Microsoft. Can I build a search engine? I know page ranking. I know those algorithms. I worked on that. Now that I'm out, do you think I can build a search engine? Yes, no? Where will you get the data from? Where will you get the data from? You know, when you type something, there is a data set, it starts trying to fill it up. Google or Bing, they, they, with the data set, they understand what is your intent. The data set is important for intent. But sometimes that data set can backfire on you. How? If you see O, it's he or she, but because it's cook, it's made it she. Okay, nurse, it made it she. He's a doctor. Teacher, she. Lover, friend is he, lover is she. Uh, She's married and he's single. <laughs> 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 yes. When I was building this, my wife was nearby. So I was on liberty. <laughs> so actually, it was she is not happy. So, question Are Google engineers sexist? 
Data, 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 my last slide and I'll close. <laughs> so, nowadays, it's what happens is, you know, when initially Amazon, Amazon.com came, the whole e-commerce, we know all that, we went through that cycle. They said, oh, I'm also an internet firm. I have a shopping mall and I'll add a website. And I'm an internet firm. True? False? Mostly false. None of them could compete against Amazon because Amazon used to do A-B testing of every page. Rather, they do a multivariate testing. They have a short cycle time because they take the feedback and put a loop. And the decision making is at PM level, at engineer level. While a traditional place, the decision making is at a much senior level. So that's why a shopping mall could never become, just by adding a website, could not become an internet firm. Now, every firm now says, let's, let's become an AI firm. I am doing something on AI. But can every firm be an AI firm? Just because you have taken the traditional company and you are now during, doing neural networks. <laughs> if you don't have strategic data acquisition where you are creating one data lake, you don't have a unified data warehouse, and you understood where all the automation can happen. Like simple thing, if you take if you take a piece of document or you do one, you take a decision and it takes one second of your time. Oh, this goes here. This goes here. It takes a second. All that can be automated. You say yes or no. That can be automated because it takes a second. So you have listed out all those things that can be automated. And you have new job descriptions like data scientist and PM. Then it is not an AI. So in closing, what I want to leave you with is AI is now the electricity, but data is the oil. Previously, we used to get started with the product, with the product idea, and look at, like you all said, hey, let's do competitive analysis. Let's look at the data. Let's look at different data sources. Now, it's not only looking at data from the different data sources. You have to get hold of data sets that are unique, that you can ask questions to. So as a PM, you need to get hold of a data set, and you need to know what questions to ask in the data set. That is what is the big change. And that's why you see there is a whole lot of change that's happening with AI. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.